And, and please do consider in the French is much less intimidating than you. <laughs> and um, also gives you the best opportunity to ask her questions. So, Dr. Walwick, while well, she was, she was Miss Walwick when she, when she first joined us. But before she joined us, she, uh, she started in medicine, started in MBCHB, and then was fascinated by the brain, so changed to a, a psychology and neuropsychology degree in Istanbul, Boston University, a really prestigious university in particular that had a very good psychology department. And after the uh, graduated uh, very well, uh, she, uh, her supervisors, of course, wanted to retain her there, um, that she could continue doing the masters and PhD there that she wanted to come back to South Africa. So that was great for us, of course. And, uh, and how often it happens, it certainly happened in my life, maybe it happened, happened in your life as well. You're on a trajectory to do something, and then a random chance encounter with someone completely changes the course of your life. And at one point she was considering doing uh, graduate studies in the US. But she happened to have coffee where somebody was passing through Istanbul, um, a woman, a wonderful friend of, of ours who's a psychiatrist, who happened to be married to the head of pediatric surgery whose office was next to mine. <laughs> and, um, and this woman phoned up her husband. She said, look, I've just met this incredibly dynamic woman um, she wants to do a graduate studies in, in the U.S., but he's quite keen to do a master's uh, in Cape Town, spend a year or two in Cape Town, and then use that as a, as a platform to go to the U.S. And uh, we've got to find a way to employ her. She's interested in the brain. And he said, how long is she about the brain? But let me speak to the guys in my office next door to me. So he comes, he walks into my office, he says, Vigaji, you've just got to employ this woman. She's amazing. He never met her. <laughs> and it just so happened to be that I was on a plaque at the time to try to change our department um, to include not just neurosurgeons, because there's a big neurosurgeons are wonderful as you heard yesterday, <laughs> but uh, they have severe limitations. And uh, one of those limitations is you become neurosurgeons, and I was training neurosurgeons, and they want to learn to operate. And their value, their sense of self-value and the sense of value to the site, society is what they can do with their hands. Um, but they don't, they're not always interested in the research component that actually increases your ability to do the things with your hands. And you'll hear a lot about that over the next, of course, the, the next couple of days. So there are very few people who, and this is, this is worldwide, who are as interested in the science of the brain as they are and what you can do to the brain. And we were trying to change it. And one of the, the strategies that I thought would be a great strategy, and I just happened to be thinking uh, about that at the time, was to get more people in our department who are invested in our department that are exposed to all the, the clinical material, the people that we have to treat but who don't have to run to the operating theater all the time and can engage in the, the science of it. And one of my concerns is that neuroscience and, and clinical work, neurology and neurosurgery, began as one and the same. And that's how we learned about the brain. And we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. But progressively over time, they've, they've gone on to divergent courses. So neuroscience has been very, very disconnected and very worryingly for me from the actual people who need to benefit from it. And I thought this was a great way of trying to bring that back into uh, connection with the people who really do benefit. And to do so, we needed to get people in from outside. And then he comes first in the office and says, you've got to employ this, this woman. So he knew nothing about it. And I said, how that sounds impressive. Uh, and I just happened to be looking for, for someone. So he says, excellent, fantastic. She's going to land here in March. I'm going to have dinner at my place. I'm going to invite you all couple of hours from your department to get to meet her and uh, and her mother who is here. There's another. Her uh, most dynamic woman. <laughs> and on the basis of meeting 
uh, meeting with Harriman for a while, uh, this, um, this woman must indeed be something very special. And so she started a master's in neuroscience. With her, and a master's of neuroscience was a new degree that had been started in the university. So you could come into a master's of neuroscience through very special people. Neurosurgery, neurology, psychology, psychiatry. Um, and so she was the first master's in neuroscience. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's already lost. Let me tell you a story. Yeah, um, there's really? going to be no time left for the lecture. I can stand here for the next hour. But look, they don't look like they're bored. <laughs> So she started with us in March, and it's usually a two-year degree, and she, she had no background um, to us. She did a, to, to at least a master's degree on them. some of the, the high-end brain monitoring we do in the, in the ICU, none of which she'd been exposed to. And she handed her thesis in six months later. And she was, uh, she was the first MSc neuroscience in the, the university. And then, of course, she's gone from strength to strength. She so enjoyed the work. And she completely abandoned her plans to go to the US and want to do a PhD with us. And she, so she did a PhD in medical time as well. And now has become a neuroscience fellow in the newly launched UCT Neuroscience Institute. Um, I think one of the things that makes her quite remarkable is that she is as strong in the basic science aspects of neuroscience as she is in the clinical science of neuroscience. Um, she doesn't do only one thing. You'll hear about a talk, talk about TB meningitis and brain crawl and a whole bunch of other things that we do with it. And probably, I mean, apart from her academic credentials, last year, for instance, she had the best paper publication in the Faculty of, of Health Sciences. But probably the, the, the best tribute is that there are many folks that I've known all over the years that I've grown up with in, in research, from all clinical, and all very, very good guys from Cambridge University, from Johns Hopkins. Uh, Etc. And um, even though she's come in from a non-clinical um, perspective, um, they respect her and value her as much as any clinician. So she knows how to manage neurocritical care patients as as well as any clinician that I've ever met. And uh, she's been a, a great credit to us. Uh, I hope she's going to give great value to you. Um, <laughs> Incredibly 
um, magnificent organ, one can't help but wonder about the evolution of the brain. So human beings uh, developed at the end of a very long line of evolution that spanned many millennia. And although we coexisted with many animals that were much stronger and much more powerful than us, somehow we managed to secure our position at the top of the food chain. And even within um, the hominid um, development and evolution, Homo sapiens lived alongside other hominid species, particularly the Neanderthals. And the Neanderthals were not thick-headed brutes the way they are often portrayed. They were actually an incredibly strong and very intelligent group, um, and they had bigger brains than we did. But something gave us an edge uh, over which we pushed all the other human species, um, and gave us an edge to establish ourselves at the top of the food chain, and now sadly to the peril of all the creatures that developed alongside us. And what was that age? The age was really the development of the, of the brain. So this is a developmental tree, um, and it shows the, um, the setup of the brains of various lower order animals, and then we've got humans at the top. So you can see that uh, there were two major things that changed. One, um, our brains changed in size. They became very, uh, very much bigger. But a bigger brain doesn't, necess doesn't necessarily mean a better brain. Um, it's about increasing um, in certain components of the brain, certain important parts that then have an increase in neurons that offer greater computational power to the brain. The second thing was our brains increased considerably in the complexity with which they function. So if you have a look, um, you can see here that most of the animal brains are dominated by the red, blue, and yellow areas. Those are the areas of basic function, sensory motor function, vision, and hearing. And you can imagine for animals, these are key for survival. You need to see and hear your predator, or you see your prey, and you need to be able to escape or hunt, and these are the things that are required for survival. Now, in the human brain, we developed, we have those primary um, functional areas, but you can see that we have a lot of brain that is free to do other things apart from that. And what those parts of the brain really have enabled is a much more sophisticated processing of our primary functions and then um, higher order functions like language, cognition, thought, emotion, and so forth. So Prof. Gaggi gave a very beautiful introduction yesterday to the anatomy of the brain and the different functions of the different lobes. Um, but these association areas were really <laughs> important in, in increasing our capacity. Um, and a big part of that was that neurons started to make connections with neurons far away. So in the blue here, um, you'll see those are the primary function areas. And the neurons in those areas, they make connections with other neurons quite close to them. But in these orange and red areas, the neurons actually make connections with other neurons that are quite a bit further away. Um, so that enables that holistic experience, um, like the example of the pianist yesterday. To be able to play the piano, you need motor skills. You need to be able to see, to read the music, you need to be able to hear, to hear what you're producing. But those additional um, parts of the experience, the anxiety of what the audience will think of you, your own judgment of your performance, the emotions that may be um, awakened in you either by the music or by the fear of the situation, all of, all of those parts of experience um, are really enabled by this greater complexity and this integration of the many different sides of the brain. So not only were we able to make more complex um, connections, but the way in which those connections were made were also more sophisticated. So instead of a quite a basic stepwise approach, we suddenly have the capacity to flexibly um, uh, form these, these uh, connections. And there's a lot of variability. Each person in this room's brain will look different based on their experience, their skills, the things they do. So this allows us to be flexible and dynamic. Um, and this has really created what we refer to as the brain's connectome. Um, this is a tractography image, and essentially this shows you, the lines show you connections between neurons. And you can see that neurons connect with each other, and there are sort of uh, vastly spread connections over the full extent of the human brain. So with this increased cognitive capacity, um, we were able to do many things that improved our 
survival, domestication of animals, development of tools, control of fire, etc. But then we also developed language. Uh, and if any of you have read the book by um, Yuval Harari, Sapiens, mm -hmm. he refers to language um, as being the major contributor to uh, the success of Homo sapiens over other species. And the reason is he suggests that with a limited number of sounds, we were able to develop something with which we could um, develop unlimited sentences. And with that, we have an explosion of the information that we could express, the information we could take in, the information we could learn, um, and recently, sorry, went the wrong way, we were also able to communicate things that we imagined um, and beliefs that we had collectively. Uh, and that enabled us to cooperate and become more cohesive as groups. We developed <coughs> bigger and more stable groups that became more dominant and more powerful and more productive. We developed cultures, governance, art, all of those things that we associate with civilization. So this is essentially the cognitive revolution that occurred between 70 and 30,000 years ago. And it was really driven by the, um, by the maturation of the brain to the form that it is now. And there are various genes that um, have been identified as having been part of this process. Genes that um, were switched on in humans or developed in humans that weren't present in other animals. Um, and also genes that were switched off in humans. So for example, the genes that actually curb the growth of neurons and the growth of the brain, those were switched off in, human, in humans. But if we compare our genome to non-human primates, they still have that gene that controls the expansion of the brain. So now that we are confronted with this incredible organ that we have, um, and neuroscience is really at center stage uh, in the 21st century because we need to and we want to understand our brains. Um, and there are many reasons why uh, we would want to understand our brains and many ways in which we can do that. And the how question I will deal with on Thursday. Um, so today I want to deal with the why question. So I would suggest that key reasons why we want to understand our brains is we want to understand how they develop and how they function over the course of the lifespan. What are the determinants of good brain development? What are the determinants of good brain health? And therefore we want to understand what happens when they malfunction and when they're ill. Um, and therefore also how we treat that. Uh, Prof. Gadget gave the example yesterday of putting a bit of cold water on the brain stem and stopping the heart. It's a really sensitive organ. We have to be very careful in the way that it's treated and it's very, very complex. We also have a desire to understand ourselves. So yesterday was the conversation, is the seat of the soul the heart? We no longer think that. We know that the brain um, is really the place where we have mind, where we have feeling, where we have experience. And so I'll talk a little bit about um, the brain as the organic constituents of self and the soul. And then, of course, engineers, mathematicians, software developers, they've, um, they've identified the incredible efficiency um, and sophistication of the way in which the brain works, and they're trying to emulate that in the systems that they are building, in the technology that they're building now, and technology for the future. So artificial intelligence, computational neuroscience, systems development, they are a vast subject. Um, I think that could be a, a summer school course on its own. So I won't speak too much about this, but the point is really that as we understand our brains that have evolved over millennia, we can really use that to improve the technology that we have today. So the brain is really our companion during the course um, of, of life. And it go undergoes different phases of development, uh, and it has different vulnerabilities and different strengths at the different phases in life. So I'll talk a little bit about the development or the functioning of the brain at different phases, and then I'll give an example of a pathology that happens and what we can learn and take from that. So if we start um, with the development of the brain in utero, um, in the developing baby, um, the, the brain and the spinal cord develop from uh, neural uh, tissue that's called the neural tube. And the reason it's called the neural tube is um, it's flat to begin with and then it folds over and closes. Um, and then from there the brain develops and the spinal cord. But what happens in some cases where that tube doesn't close properly, um, one has extrusion of the 
nervous tissue outside of the spinal canal. Um, and so these babies are often born um, with uh, big, either wounds or a pouch, some, something that could be covered in skin or not covered in skin, but it's essentially nervous system material that is pushing out through um, the spinal canal. And unfortunately, that nervous tissue is not much. But it's also often a manifestation of other things that have gone wrong um, in development. So these patients often have associated cognitive deficits because the brain didn't develop in time properly. Um, they may have a skull malformations. They have um, a vulnerability to infections. And hydrocephalus, Pop was telling you yesterday, when the water increases in the brain, um, they're often paralyzed. They often have bladder and bowel incontinence, sensory, um, a lack of sensation. So it's really a very debilitating uh, condition. And it, it still occurs quite frequently. But in studying the process of, of development, uh, they realize that there is a key a vitamin that we need. It's essentially folic acid, vitamin B9, which greatly decreases um, the chance of a neural tube defect. So it's a fairly simple thing. Um, that's why mothers are women who want to become pregnant and women who are pregnant are encouraged to eat foods rich in folate and to take supplements. But in a country like ours and in other low and middle income countries, most mothers don't have access to supplements and are poorly nourished. So that's where a simple public health intervention like fortifying food can make a massive difference to the, to the health of our, of our young population. So all of our, our flour and maize meal in South Africa is fortified with folate, as well as other substances. And that's made a big difference um, in, in the incidence of neural tube defects. So a simple thing where just understanding the process has really given us um, a way in which we can improve health. We know that in the first two years of life, there's this incredible exponential growth in babies. Um, we all know the phases that they go through, the motor phases, the cognitive phases. Um, and this incredible growth is as a result of um, great neuronal plasticity, um, the process of myelination, and the proliferation of synapses. So I want to explain what each of those things are. Um, so We'll begin by sort of zooming in and looking at the brain on a cellular level. So I think everybody is aware of the fact that one of the key cells in the brain is the neuron. And it looks something like this. Um, it has a cell body with these um, sort of hairs that stick out. They're called dendrites. It has a long tail called an axon. And that um, axon has little feet at the end of it. Uh, and neurons communicate with each other really at the point of their dendrites and at the point of the terminal of the axon. And I will show you how they do that. But there are other key cells that are also important. There are microglia, which you see over here. They are the resident immune cell in the brain. So if the brain is exposed to infection, injury, inflammation, the microglia are the ones that are going to mount the immune response. And they are the ones that are going to attract um, immune, pro immune factors from the periphery to come to the brain to aid in that process. Astrocytes, you can see over here, they provide structural support for the neurons. They also form a very important part of the blood-brain barrier, which prevents um, the indiscriminate influx of chemicals and substances into the brain. Um, and they also clean away the debris that's released from neurons, and they provide neurons with nutrients. And there's a beautiful metabolic dance between neurons and astrocytes that we're only really beginning to understand now. The third cell is the oligodendrocyte, um, and the oligodendrocyte produces myelin. Um, so what it does is it essentially wraps itself um, around the axon of the neuron, you can see here. There, it's just wrapped this myelin around the, the, the neuron's axon. So this is a myelinated neuron. This is an unmyelinated neuron. So that myelin um, is composed of protein and fatty acids. So it's white in nature. So what this means is that when we talk about gray matter and white matter of the brain, the gray matter is the part where the cell bodies of the neurons are found. 
and the white matter is the part where the axons that are myelinated are found. So Prof showed you a picture like this, coronal view of the brain. You can see the gray matter on the outside, the white matter on the inside, and the white matter is what develops these incredible tracts across the brain. So what is the relevance of myelin? Uh, I think everybody knows that the brain communicates in a chemical, electrical fashion. So what happens is, if you imagine we've zoomed in, um, this is the axon here, and the pink area is outside of the axon membrane. So inside the axon, um, it's filled with ions that are largely negatively charged ions. So the inside of the axon is negatively charged. And the outside of the axon is largely filled with ions that are positively charged. So you have a potential difference um, across the membrane of the axon. When the neuron is stimulated, there are ion channels in this membrane that open. And they allow, and I'll show you a uh, demonstration of this here on this video, they allow the influx of positive ions into the axon. And that generates an electrical current. And that is called an action <coughs> potential. And that is the basis of neural firing and neural signaling. Now, if we add myelin into the picture, oh, sorry. All right. So here we have a myelinated axon. And you can see that there are small spots where the axon is not myelinated. And those are called the nodes of Ranvia. Now, the action potential that is generated um, in, the in the neuron um, can only develop at these individual points where there is no myelin. So if you have the electrical current coming down, it will pass passively through the myelin, generate an action potential, pass passively through the myelin, generate an action potential. And the result of this is essentially this. You can appreciate that this is a lot faster um, than what we saw in the other um, uh, image. So myelin is really what um, is responsible for the high-speed electrical activity of the brain. Uh, and it's also very energy economic because instead of having to have ion channels all the way along the length of the axon, you only need to have them at certain points. The brain is highly energy consumptive. That's why many animals didn't develop such sophisticated brains because it requires a lot of energy and there was a risk-benefit ratio of developing an organ that is so energy intense. Um, but the myelin um, along these axons is, is really important in reducing the energy that's required. So now we want to talk about how one neuron communicates with another. We know that the way in which the neuron generates its signal is through this electrical process that I showed you. So the neurons will communicate with each other at the level of where they, uh, a terminal foot of one neuron communicates with the dendrite of another neuron. Um, and what happens is that the action potential travels down the neuron to the terminal and the electrical charge opens the membrane at the bottom of the terminal and these vesicles with neurotransmitters um, are, are free to release their neurotransmitter into this space um, that exists between this neuron and that neuron. And this space is called the synapse. So a synapse is a point of connection between two neurons. Um, and what happens once the neurotransmitters are released, I think many people will be familiar with the term neurotransmitters. There's some very popular ones, like serotonin, dopamine, and so on. These are chemicals that perpetuate the electrical signal from one neuron to the next. So they bind to the membrane of the next neuron. They essentially um, open that membrane and they release their contents into the next neuron. And that starts an action potential in the next neuron. So neurons fire a bit like this. So you can see that the signal is transported very, very quickly. Um, and you can also see that each neuron, if you think it's got so many dendrites and a number of axon terminals, it's each of those ends of a dendrite can make a connection with another neuron, of which each of its uh, 
uh, dendrites can make the connection with another neuron. And so it goes on exponentially. So when people talk about the fact that we only use 10% of our brain, what they're actually saying is that we have the capacity almost to make an infinite number of synaptic connections. Um, but we don't use all of those. And as Prof gave the example yesterday with um, patients who suffer from synesthesia, it is not to our advantage to necessarily use um, that full potential. But that's essentially what they're referring to. And when we refer to the plasticity of the brain, we refer to the ability of neurons to develop synapses with other neurons and to change those synapses depending on what the child is learning. And over time, those connections will then solidify and settle down. Is this clear up until this point? I guess I just have one question. Yes. All these different neurotransmitters. Yes. Are they, I mean, in any one of these axon tails and these vesicles, yeah. would they hold the complete mix of or different? Yeah. No, they will hold different kinds. So motor neurons, for example, will uh, produce dopamine. Um, so in different parts of the brain, they will produce different neurotransmitters. Um, so this is, I just wanted to show you, these are, I showed you all sort of drawings, but these are two actual neurons. Um, they were from tissue that needed to be resected from one of our patients. Um, and our colleague, Joe Raimondo, um, actually studies the electrical activity of individual neurons. And so he produced this still image. You've got two neurons here. You can see the cell bodies. You can see the axons. And you can see lots of dendrites. Um, and then I, I think that this, um, this image provides a wonderful demonstration of the electrical activity of the brain. And we will talk a little bit more about that on Thursday when it comes to actually looking at that electrical activity and the implications of it. Okay. Um, so during childhood, um, that plasticity and myelination continues. So the white matter of the brain gets thicker, um, and they develop, and it becomes more complex. So they develop the frontal lobes, um, the temporal lobes, and they become better at judgment, social skills, at cognition, all those sorts of things happen during um, childhood as the, um, as the brain is, is growing and developing and all that plasticity is happening. But at the same time, it's a, a very vulnerable time for children um, because if, if things are disturbed, um, you can disturb that, uh, that process of growth and development. So we will think about the growth of children often in the sense of milestones. Um, and we think about neurodevelopmental milestones. So those will be things like at a certain age they should be able to do X, at another age they should be able to do Y. So I'm going to give you an example um, of uh, when that development is disturbed. <laughs> so we see a lot of tuberculosis um, in South Africa, particularly in the Western Cape. And the most severe form of tuberculosis is when the, the TB bacilli disseminate from the lungs into Brain. And that causes a disease called tuberculous meningitis. It's the most fatal form of TB. It's another major research area of ours. Um, and it essentially results in a very <coughs> prolific um, disease response in the brain that often causes um, tissue death, infarcts, um, to occur in the brain. And that's why the mortality rate is quite high. And in those patients who survive, they often have very obvious disabilities. But in the patients who look okay, they look clinically fine. You, you see them running down the streets, they're jumping, they're talking, they're laughing. You think they're okay. But we decided to look at whether they were neurodevelopmentally fine. Um, and what we found was that when we looked at locom locomotion, so movement, their personal social skills, hearing and speech, eye-hand coordination and performance, all of the children had deficits, whether they look clinically normal or not. So that shows us that even if there isn't an obvious infarct in the brain, there is something that has changed, something that has been disturbed by the disease process that has had a repercussion for that child. When we're trying to understand, we will hopefully take it further to try to understand what that is. Um, but it also has implications for rehabilitation, how to properly rehabilitate and educate these patients. So I just want to show you a little example um, of one of our patients. 
Um, he was asked, so he's given three boxes um, and little blocks, and they are different colors. And he was asked to take the little block, the little blocks, and put them into the big boxes that are the same color, and then he must put the lid on. Um, and this is something that at his age he should be able to do. But what you can see is that um, he is putting the wrong color blocks, um, in, or he's not coordinating the color. Um, he's putting the blocks into the lids and not necessarily into the big boxes. Um, earlier he tried to put another block in here, um, and he struggles also to put the lid on. So this is just to give you a little example of the kind of thing um, that we look for and ways in which we can try to assess the development of the brain during childhood. So we mentioned that the plasticity um, continues during childhood and adolescence, um, and that uh, makes the brain also quite vulnerable. Uh, in adolescence, for example, there's quite a bit of research looking at the vulnerability of the adolescent brain to drugs. Um, and also the brain is not mature, and an immature brain makes not always healthy decisions. So children and adolescents often engage in risk-taking behavior because they don't fully have the judgment and they can't fully evaluate their decisions, and a lot of those risk-taking behaviors end in a traumatic brain injury. So traumatic brain injuries are the leading cause of death from trauma um, in the youth of South Africa but it's a massive global problem. The burden of disease in the US, for example, is really, really high, and it's something that occurs all over the world. So a severe traumatic brain injury is the ones that land patients in the ICU um, on ventilators. Um, and this is a life or death moment a lot of the time. And so the, the, to understand the brain and how it's responding um, to the injury is critical in deciding how to manage that brain. Uh, and this is another big area of research for us. Um, we do a lot of research on how to manage these patients in the acute environment, and to do that in an individual way, because each child's brain is different, um, each child's injury is different, how the brain is gonna to respond to the injury is different, how the brain is gonna to respond to treatment is different. So by understanding the dynamics of exactly what the brain is doing, um, we try to improve management of these patients. But then you have a lot of um, moderate and mild head injuries. Many of these are as a result of contact sports. And this is becoming a much um, bigger subject of research and interest at the moment. Um, and the reason is that we're realizing that concussion is not as benign as we may have thought. Uh, there's a lot of research, is doing a study in rugby players at high schools in Cape Town, um, and there are many other studies all over the world that are looking at children who are playing contact sports. Uh, and this really came to the fore um, through research that was done um, on professional NFL players. So the American football players, uh, some of them, their brains, well, some of them have recently, they subsequently donated their brains, but in the beginning it, it was not a case of, um, of a sort of formal decision to research this. But when they did a post-mortem on one of the professional players after he had died, they saw that there were very clear signs of neurodegeneration and he was quite young. And they have subsequently researched that further and there is very clear evidence of neurodegeneration in these um, sportsmen. And so the theory is that mild concussions or repeated concussions um, sets up what seems to be a kind of inflammatory response in the brain. It's a low-level response, but it's crime. So it's ongoing during the course um, of life, and then lands up um, beginning a neurodegenerative process. So understanding how the brain responds to concussion um, is really important in terms of the way in which children are managed to play sports. So when do they return to play if they've had a concussion? How should they best recover? from a concussion, what are the implications of concussion? Um, so this is also a really, really big area of research at the moment. So after young adulthood, um, in the, the proliferation of synapses slows down. Um, a lot of synapses get pruned, so connections we don't need are eliminated. And then during adulthood, there's a balance of the creation of new synapses and the pruning of synapses that we don't need. But then, of course, when we get to older age, um, the real key 
um, concern is neurodegeneration. And one of the major concerns is dementia, um, uh, Alzheimer's in terms of memory loss, but there are also motor deficits like Parkinson's disease. So there's been a lot of research to try to understand what causes dementia. So dementia is a group of symptoms um, in an individual who has lost um, various cognitive functions like memory and so on to a point where they are no longer able to perform their daily activities. Uh, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. So there's been a lot of research to try to understand what causes it, how can we detect it early on, and is there a cure or are there treatment options? So I'm going to show you a video um, that was put together by the American National Institute of Health. I think it very succinctly summarizes where we act in terms of neurodegeneration research. Um, and now that you understand anatomy and you understand action potentials and nut synapses and neurotransmission, I think the, movie, the video will be very easy for you to understand. Oh, this is where I needed some. Oh, I forgot about that. Memories and feelings are the result of signals that pass through billions of nerve cells or neurons in the brain. Neurons constantly communicate with each other through electrical charges that travel down axons, causing the release of chemicals across tiny gaps to neighboring neurons. Other cells in the brain, such as astrocytes and microglia, clear away debris and help keep neurons healthy. In a person with Alzheimer's disease, the most basic form of dementia, toxic changes in the brain destroy this healthy balance. These changes may occur years, even decades, before the first signs of dementia. Researchers believe that this process involves two proteins, called beta amyloid and tau, which somehow become toxic to the brain. It appears that abnormal tau accumulates, eventually forming tangles inside neurons. And beta amyloid clumps into plaques, which slowly build up between neurons. As the level of amyloid reaches a tipping point, there is a rapid spread of tau throughout the brain. But tau and beta amyloid may not be the only factors involved in Alzheimer's. Other changes that affect the brain may also play a role over time. The vascular system may fail to deliver sufficient blood and nutrients to the brain. The brain may lack the glucose needed to power its activity. Chronic inflammation sets in as microglial cells fail to clear away debris and astrocytes react to distressed microglia. Eventually, neurons lose their ability to communicate. As neurons die, the brain shrinks, beginning in the hippocampus, a part of the brain important to learning and memory. People may begin to experience memory loss, impaired decision-making, and language problems. As more neurons die throughout the brain, a person with Alzheimer's gradually loses the ability to think, remember, make decisions, and function independently. Achieving a deeper understanding of the molecular and cellular mechanisms and how they may interact is vital to the development of effective therapies. Much progress has been made in identifying various underlying factors. Advances in brain imaging allow us to see the course of plaques and tangles in the living brain. Blood and fluid biomarkers are providing insights about when the disease starts and how it progresses. More is also known about the genetic underpinnings of the disease and how they can affect particular biological pathways. These advances enable the development and testing of promising new therapies, including drugs that reduce or clear the increase of tau and amyloid proteins in the brain, therapies targeting the vascular system, glucose metabolism, and inflammation, and lifestyle interventions like exercise or diet, and behavioral approaches like social engagement that may enhance brain health. Research is moving quickly, ever closer to the day when we can delay or even prevent the devastation of dementia. Okay, 
Okay, so <clears throat> I, I think that that was a really good summary of what's happening in the brain as it ages. Unfortunately, there is currently still no cure um, for Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, but a lot of research is trying to identify it early, before the symptoms set in, because a lot of those interventions, the behavioral interventions, lifestyle interventions, help at that early stage to actually just delay the onset um, of the very severe symptom. <coughs> Uh, this is quite different from um, motor deficits, like um, in Parkinson, Parkinson's, for example. So there, um, the neurons that produce dopamine, uh, the motor neurons, um, degenerate. And so the dopamine isn't produced, and it becomes very difficult for the individual to initiate movement. Um, they may suffer from tremors, um, uh, contractures of the muscles, and that sort of thing. Again, uh, there's no cure as yet, but treatment involves giving synthetic dopamine because the brain isn't producing enough of it, and that can ameliorate the symptoms somewhat. So I want to finish off by talking about the brain in the context of self and the soul. So we obviously have this uh, question about whether the brain um, or what about the brain makes up the organic constituents of soul and self identity. And when I think about this question, um, it's not something that we work with. We work on, you know, um, uh, on, on traumatic injury that can have a, a memory loss component. But I think of this um, in relation to patients who develop. Um, amnesia as a result of injuries to the brain and then of course people who um, may develop Alzheimer's. But memory for me is one of those areas that I think uh, most easily, at least for me, gives the opportunity to think about the organic underpinnings of memory. We know about the hippocampus, we know about the limbic system, we know about everything that contributes to memory. But then there are also the more um, abstract issues um, that surround memory, um, which I'll talk about a little bit now. So um, there's a wonderful uh, doctor, uh, he's passed away recently, Dr. Oliver Sacks. I'm sure some of you have read his books. Yeah. So his books are wonderful, and um, one of the reasons I enjoyed them so much was he approaches um, patients and, and thinks about conditions that have had a very real impact on the being and the existence of a patient. And he tries to grapple with those, um, the difficult questions about what it means to a patient to experience loss of something um, that contributes to their being as an overall individual. Um, and he was encouraged in his pursuit by his mentor, um, Dr. Alexander Luria, who is a very famous Russian neurologist, um, who said that the physical foundation of persona and self are revealed for our study in cases where patients have experienced um, pathology. And it demands a new sort of neurology, a personalistic or romantic science. And I think that's really key. We need to combine both empiricism um, and abstract concepts and thoughts when we approach this question. So, um, Dr. Sachs begins his section on memory with this quote by the famous Spanish filmmaker. You have to begin to lose your memory, in, if only in bits and pieces, to realize that memory is what makes our lives. Life without memory is no life at all. Our memory is our coherence, our reason, our feeling, and even our action. So he gives examples of two patients who both suffered from Kosakos syndrome. Um, and that is when uh, excessive alcohol consumption leads to liver disease and degeneration of the mammillary bodies, which Prof showed you yesterday. Um, and what happens in these patients is they lose, uh, they become amnesic from this moment going forward, um, but also they have retrograde amnesia, so they lose a part of their memory of their life before. So the first patient that he saw um, was called William, and he presented quite early on after beginning or after demonstrating uh, the signs of Kosciuszko syndrome. And he describes William as being somebody who was completely disoriented because he had no sense of self and he had no sense of where he was, and he thought of himself as a young man. So he couldn't recognize his friends or his 
family because he couldn't realize why they were suddenly so old. He couldn't remember the 20 years of his life before. Um, and so he seemed to try to bridge this abyss of amnesia by creating fictional um, stories where stories had been lost. So when he met people, he didn't know who they were, he'd make up a story of who they were. If there was an event, he couldn't remember the event, he'd make up a story about the event. So he was constantly doing what's called confabulating. It's essentially building fictional worlds, pseudo-characters. Um, and the question is, did he, in the process, lose um, his inner narrative? Because as, as humans, physiologically, biologically, physically, we're not different from each other. But in terms of our histories and our narratives, the lives that we've lived in our inner story, that makes us unique. And so one asks the question, can you hold on to your identity um, if you lose that inner narrative? The second case was a patient also with Kosakoff syndrome, but he could had the disease for quite a long time, um, so he was not confabulating anymore. But he was described as being a very quiet um, individual who seemed isolated in a single moment in time, surrounded by a moat of forgetting. And Dr. Sachs asked him, do you feel alive? And he answered, I haven't felt alive in a very long time. And <coughs> in his case, we see an individual who has lost his future, He's lost his past, and he's lost his roots in the now and in the present. And so Dr. Sachs described him as a lost soul. And he asked the nursing staff who were helping him care for this patient if they also felt this sense that he was a lost soul. And they said, no, you must observe him when he goes to church. Because in church, he exhibited a kind of focus and concentration which he was not able to apply to anything else. Because with any other activity that lasted more than a few minutes, he couldn't focus because he was constantly forgetting. Um, but in church, it was a different experience. And so uh, Dr. Sachs discusses this, um, this question of whether we are only our memories, or whether we are more than that. We have feelings, we have will, we have sensibilities, and we have a moral being. Um, and he says, uh, matters of which neuropsychology cannot speak. So the brain has really propelled us as a human race to this incredible position of power and productivity and creativity and innovation. And it's revealed itself to us very slowly over time. Um, and and Prophet Yaji will talk more about that tomorrow. But now we have the tools to really understand it or to really study it. We have the insight to know its central role that it plays over the course of our lives but also in the experience of our lives and ourselves. So neuroscience begs big questions that have no answers. Questions that are both physical 